What would you consider a large smallmouth bass? 15 inches, 17 inches, maybe 20 inches or more? Or would poundage be a better size class to determine what a large fish is? Or does size even really matter with smallmouth? In today's episode, we're going to get you excited for smallmouth bass fishing. And we're going to talk about some topwater action, how to get your gear ready for some topwater action, which situation might present itself for streamer fishing a little bit better. And today we're going to get our coaching from one of the best shops in the country to assure your next trip for smallmouth bass is even more successful. This is the Wet Fly Swing Podcast, where I show you the best places to travel to for fly fishing, how to find the best resources and tools to prepare for that big trip, and what you can do to give back to the fish species we all love. Hey, I'm Dave, host of the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. I've been fly fishing since I was a little kid. I grew up around a little fly shop and have created one of the largest fly fishing podcasts in this country. I've also interviewed more of the greatest fly anglers and shop owners than just about anyone out there. Mike Schultz of Schultz Outfitters is going to take us into smallmouth bass fishing today so you have a better chance at finding and landing more and larger fish on the water. You're going to find out how to headhunt correctly, what this is all about, why the angle is so important, why this is the number one thing you should be thinking about when smallmouth bass fishing, and how temperature is going to dictate which method you choose throughout the year and, uh, and how that is affected by different factors throughout the season. We're also going to find out about these soft-shelled turtles and how you can chase them around and get more success with bass as well. Plus, you're going to find out how to claim your spot for this trip. We're heading out with Schultz Outfitters, so if you want to get excited and get on this trip, it's coming up on this episode. The species that some of the biggest and best anglers in the country consider their number one, let's find out why they do it. Here we go. Mike Schultz from SchultzOutfitters.com. How you doing, Mike? Good, brother. How are you? Great. Great. Yeah, this is uh, exciting to have you back on. It's been, I think, over three years since we chatted. And the nice thing about this is, you know, means that we're putting together a trip with you, which is exciting. Uh, so we're we're going to be talking about that today, this giveaway event we have going and just uh, this finally getting on the water. But um, let's take it back real quick. You know, 2021, I think in the summer was the last episode. What have you been up to in the last few years? Ah, um, most of the same, you know, especially on the fishing end of thing and the business end of things. Um, yeah, just fishing, fishing hard. Uh, you know, I would say the biggest life change is my, uh, my kids are, are growing up fast, Yep. <laughs> you know, and, uh, fortunately get to spend a ton of time, uh, with them during the summer fishing, spend a lot of time on the water with them and teaching and, uh, just sharing my passion and love for, uh, for fishing. Awesome. Yeah. And you're, so I've seen some of the stuff out there, right? Baseball. Is that, is that the one that's into the baseball? Yes. Yes. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, both children, Danner and Dylan are both into, uh, they play travel baseball and travel hockey. So oh, wow. Both. Yeah. We run, run pretty hard. Yeah, that's right. Good. Well, maybe if we have time, we'll check on that at the end. I always love to get some sports, uh, some sports questions in, but, um, let's take it to this, to what we have going with smallmouth bass because, your name is out there. It seems like all over the place with smallmouth, and um, you know, I was just talking to somebody recently out in Oregon, and they were saying how, hey man, we got smallmouth bass out here as well, right? There's rivers all over the country, but what is it about your area, or maybe what you do, that makes it kind of unique compared to maybe some other areas? Yeah, uh, you know, native range of fish. You know, they're they're where they they they're supposed to be, which is kind of cool. The rivers around here that we fish are what most people would consider fairly small. So it's a very intimate setting, uh, where, yeah, a lot of visual aspects to it, where you, you engage the fish, you see the fish, the fish moves on the fly, the fish eats the fly. So, you know, that's, I, I've traveled and fished, you know, some of the bigger watersheds across the country and it, they're awesome. But you know, what we have here is pretty special. Um, they're smaller waters, man. It's drift boat water. And, uh, it makes it, uh, makes it really cool to tangle with those fish in that smaller arena. You know, that's what kind of gets me fired up. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And and the way you guys do it too, right. I mean, not, you're, so you're seeing the fish, maybe talk about how it works on, if you're on the water, are these mostly day trips, floating drift boat, or do you have a mix of different types of ways you can get to these fish? Yeah. Well, there's definitely different crafts you could use, but our, our standard program that, you know, we run every day with, with all the guides, uh, is everybody's got the same boat. Everyone's running a clack of craft, uh, skiff, headhunter skiff, uh, very comfortable boats, perfect 
build for our watersheds, the weight of the boat, uh, the size of the boat, the width of the boat. Uh, it's just, you know, it's made for our, our smaller waters. So, uh, we all run, uh, similar programs, but unique programs. Uh, you know, I, I hire free men. They can start when they want and they can finish when they want. So, you know, uh, some guys are like to get, it depends on the time of year, obviously, but, uh, there is at times advantages to get out really, really early. Uh, but then there's also times a year where, you know, I personally would start a trip around two o'clock sometimes, you know, depending on what program we're running. So, you know, like I said, we all run similar programs, but then we all have unique programs. And, uh, you know, one thing that's really cool about our area and the waters that we fish, it's, it's not just one river, you know, where I'm not running five guides down five floats every day and rotating the floats. It's, you're moving around, you're, you're at the uh, mercy of mother nature and what she uh, gives you when it comes to water levels and clarity and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you really have to have your finger on the pulse of it. And uh, you know, we're not like for lack of a better term, I, you know, we're not amusement park guides, you know, it's not show up at the lodge at six thirty and we leave at seven and we put the boat in at seven thirty, and the shuttle gets me back at eight fifteen, and we're off the water at three. It's, it's not like that. It's uh you know, we're fishing the proper time of day, uh, for the most success, uh, for our, for our anglers. Perfect. So yeah, tell me about the, um, a little bit about the fishing. What's that going to look like on, on our trip? Yeah. For July, it, it's like all times a year, but uh, on the summer it's, it's, uh, even more important it's water levels. So you want to find a river that has good flows, uh, this year, uh, it's, it's really been the, the year of rain. So, uh, we have flows that are comparable to say May right now, and here we are in late August. So yeah, you're always at the mercy of, of the flows of the river and that dictates the programs. And that also dictates what river or what sections of rivers are going to be firing at that time. So, uh, you know, you look back the last five years, 10 years at our programs, like, yeah, we fish certain rivers certain times a year, but it's all about the flows. So like last year was, you know, nothing like this year. So it always keeps you on your toes, but, um, you know, July, July around here is, uh, on a normal year is, is top water. So it's, uh, it's, it's fishing poppers like Google bugs. It's fishing finesse fishing, like terrestrials with, uh, you know, almost like tr- using like trout gear, pretty much six weights and going down to lighter tippets. There are some insect hatches or some uh, mayfly hatches on a few of the rivers where you have a couple of different uh, hexagenia oh, yeah. bugs that, that pop off. And, you know, that could start as early as the first week of June on some waters and roll into September uh, on some waters. So there's always choices. And, you know, we always tell people when they come here, just be flexible with like start times and whatnot if you want the best fishing. Um, because there are a bunch of different programs to run and, you know, not all the guys are running the exact same program, you know, at the same time. So yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty darn good time of year to be here, man. Flip flops and top water, small mouth. That's right. In July and, and the weather is, uh, how's the weather look in July? Like, can it get a little, uh, a little warm? Yeah. You know, you, you get a little mix of everything in Michigan, you know, they Michigan, it's like, you don't like the weather, wait an hour. Yeah. We'll see what'll happen. But, uh, yeah, it could be, could be 90, could be 75. Yeah, that's perfect. What about, and we have uh, the episode with the Huron River Watershed Council is coming on on Wednesday, um, and they're going to describe kind of the watershed, but maybe talk about that. You mentioned them as one of the conservation partners. Talk about, let's not go into the Huron right now because we're going to cover that on Wednesday, but just the watershed in general, the rivers and areas we're going to be fishing. Is this all in the Huron River? No, no. So that's what's kind of unique about our program and cool about it is we pretty much, if you Look at a map of Michigan. You drew a line from the bottom of Saginaw Bay all the way across the state over to, you know, the west side, say, you know, south of Muskegon. Pretty much everything from there down, well, we work. So there's a bunch of different rivers, uh, the Huron, the Flint, the Shiawassee, the Kalamazoo, the Raisin, the Grand, the St. Joe, oh, wow. the Flat. There's all these different rivers that... um you know, some of them go into Lake Erie, some of them go into Saginaw Bay, some of them go into the Saginaw River, um, and then you've got the tributaries on the west side that a lot of those tributaries either run into the St. Joe or they run into the Grand River. 
And uh, yeah, they're all just different, man. It's like, uh, you know, every, every section of river is, is unique. And the uh, vast majority of those uh, rivers are heavily dammed. So there are a bunch of the little rivers within rivers and each one of them has their own little unique ecosystem and, and fish. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And I always forget Michigan because it seems like it is the real unique one because you have this, uh, yeah, basically the Great Lakes, the three of them you, know, you mentioned, right? Around you, you have water essentially around you, except for on the South. Correct. So maybe let's talk about that. If we were, you know, we're coming out there in mid July, what is that day one, you know, going to look like on the water? You, you mentioned it could, depending on when we get out, you know, which guide we get, but uh, what do you, just to guesstimate, what's it going to look like the first morning that we get out there on the water? The guys that are guiding for me nonstop that time of year are usually starting their days around eight. So, you know, they're meeting their clients eight, eight thirty, depending on what river you're going to, you, you know, some places we're at the mercy of parks opening up at a certain time or being conscious of landowners and not rolling through their property at 6 a.m. So, uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, one thing that's unique about that time of year is there are uh, numbers programs and where you can go catch numbers. And like a lot of people are super happy with 15 to 17 inch fish. I don't turn my nose up that at all. Smallmouth fight super hard. If you're not a smallmouth fisherman that fishes all the time, go out and catch a bunch of 15 to 17 inch fish. You're going to be stoked, especially if it's on top water. Then there's other programs that you could run that time of year where you're going to uh, a river that say has uh, less fish, a smaller piece of water maybe, and you could really go in there and headhunt. By that time of year, definitely by that time of year, by the middle of the summer, even even by, uh, you know, once they wrap up spawning, these fish will, the big fish will get locked into an area um, and they won't, they won't move. I mean, they're just locked, they're locked in there. So they'll move, you know, they'll move. But I'm saying like you go into an area that could be, uh, a 50 foot area, the fish could be in three or four different like spots that it usually sits and you can go in there and just, you know, surgically attempt to remove them <laughs> Wow, <laughs> for a short, for a short period. So there's all kinds of stuff. And then, and then that time of year, uh, you know, you could be sitting at eight 30, looking up at the sky, enjoying a, a beer or whatever, and wait for, for the bugs to start flying. And, you know, that time of year could be like, you know, eight 30, the bugs could start flying and, by eight forty five, nine o'clock, you could be looking at a area that has fish rising everywhere, <laughs> you know, and you kind of got to figure out which one's the big one and, you know, which one's the little one. So there's all kinds of stuff. It's just, you know, once you, once you assemble your group and we have a chance to chat, we can, we can kind of come up with a game plan of, uh, of what, uh, what the guys want to do. We're totally cool with uh, doing that. Right. There's some diversity there. What is that when you're on the water and talking about, you know, fish coming up, maybe describe that. What does that look like? And then how are you choosing the big fish versus the small fish? Is it pretty easy to do? Uh, not really. Um, you know, it's kind of like a trial. The smaller ones will be pretty splashy with their, with their rises and kind of wild. Um, they're definitely the way that a small mouth feeds on those on hex. From my experience, it varies from watershed. The river right here by the house, the Huron, those fish out there could like literally line up like a brown trout and come up and just their head out of the water feeding or just barely sipping, you know, to where you go to another river where there's almost like, you know, if you're a dry fly fisherman, you, you know, even if you're a trout guy, there's areas that just kind of funnel bugs, um, and concentrate them, uh, for various reasons. And it could just be like an absolute you know, like someone's swatting them with a fly swatter and they're just wildly falling in the water and the fish are just going, Jeez. going nuts, like a feeding frenzy. But more times than not, the biggest fish that we catch on those, uh, during those hatches are the ones that like the client is like, oh, it's just a little one, you know, and it first sips it and then it's like, oh, hang on, God. you know. What is a, what is a big a smallmouth bass? Like what is the biggest, I don't even know what the record is, but what is the potential or what is the state record, that sort of stuff? Yeah. The state record in Michigan is over nine pounds. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like we don't tangle with anything remotely close to that. Those, those fish are lake fish that literally just like sit and just eat gobies, you know, and get super fat. Um, yeah, we don't really have that caliber of fish. You know, we we're more of a length, uh, kind of, uh, crew, you know, where it's, you have bump boards and, you know, a 20 inch fish is a, a mature, you know, very old river smallmouth. So, yeah. So a 20 inch is a 20 inch fish. The, I always go back to the Alaska. We were just doing some episodes there and 
everybody's talks about the 30 inch rainbow up in Alaska. And, and, you know, Mike at Mossy's was saying, Hey, I haven't seen many of those in my career. Uh, is it the same with, with smallmouth where 20 inches, you're not seeing too many of those? Yeah. I mean, I say as a crew, we're going to get between 25 and 30 a year you know, 20 or bigger. Um, and then like, yeah, I'm stoked with any, if I go out on a guide trip and a client gets a fish that's 19 and change or bigger, like that's my goal. Like the 19 inch fish are beautiful fish. They're tall, they're thick, you know, they're mature. They're just, it's just a different caliber of fish. You know, you're looking at the lines in their face and you know, they, a lot of them are banged up from past experiences with heron and whatnot. So yeah, just a really, really cool fish. Um, but yeah, like I said, 25 to 30 a year on the, on the 20 and then, uh, you know, we'll get two or three 21 inch plus fish a year. Um, you know, if you want to go pounds, like a really big river fish is five pounds. So you could have a fish that's 20 inches, you know, that goes four, or you could have a fish that's 20 inches that goes five and a half, depending on the time of year. Gotcha. Okay. And when we're on the water in the drift boat, maybe describe that again. And I'll, and I'll put a link out. We had episode uh, 229. That was the episode number we had with you where we talked about some of this. But, you know, when we're on the boat, uh, maybe describe that a little bit. If it's, uh, it depends on what's going on, but let's just say there's some top water. Describe what you're telling, you know, me or somebody on your boat to have better success. Yep. We're going to be fishing like seven weights, uh, mostly for the Google bug fishing and, and whatnot. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, depending on the size of the water, your taper, your fly line could vary from a short head, like a, you know, power taper to something like more of a mid forties, more of a, I guess, finesse style bass, bass line. So depending on what river you're on, uh, the biggest thing is the angle of approach, you know, keeping the flies out front of the boat versus off the side is important not only for the size of the rivers that we fish but um for just the the whole deal from the fly landing at a proper angle keeping it out front you know keeps you kind of undetected um and then also the way that the smallmouth eats the fly and then usually what that smallmouth does after it eats the fly keeping that fly out front is going to benefit everybody so that's the biggest thing and that's uh, you know we get people from out of town that have bass fished other places or just or haven't bass fished at all you know that's the number one thing that i can you know we, we pound home it's like you guys are going to have a way better experience if you just keep it out front so it gives the back angler a better angle and uh yeah it works it works man it, it works <laughs> this year i ventured into the heart of eastern idaho's yellowstone teton territory where the fish were larger than life and the waters held the secrets of the best fly fishing out west. With crystal clear rivers like the Henry's Fork and the South Fork of the Snake, and enough lakes to keep you going all year long, make your way to Yellowstone Teton Territory and embark on a journey to one of North America's finest fly fishing destinations. It's time to experience Eastern Idaho for yourself and support this podcast at the same time. Trout Routes is the most comprehensive mapping app for trout anglers. With over 50,000 trout streams, 350,000 access points, public land maps, and more, Trout Routes is the number one resource for navigating, researching, and exploring trout streams. You can download Trout Routes for free in the App Store today. Just search for Trout Routes on your phone and take your exploration to the next level. That's Trout Routes, T-R-O-U-T-R-O-U-T-E-S. So is it just getting the out in front just so the fish aren't spooked? Is that the main thing or are there other pieces of this? A small mouth inhales the fly, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, they, they suck it in and there's just a, a more, no slack in the line when it's out there, right? You get a really positive hook set. And then when more times than not, when that fish eats, it's going to turn downstream or slightly towards the middle of the river or back into the cover that it was, it was in. So everything's tight. Everything's out front. Versus off the side where you're one, you're going to get fish to eat that way, obviously. But a lot of times fishing at a 45 off the side of the boat, you set that hook on a bass and that hook comes flying back at you. It doesn't matter if it's a streamer or a topwater fly. So yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing. It's just everything just works better that way for, and I, and I've taken that everywhere. It doesn't matter if I'm up, you know, up North fishing or in Minnesota or Wisconsin or 
Pennsylvania or wherever, you know, that's, you know, chapter one, small mouth fly fishing by Schultz Outfitters crew. Uh, keep the fly out front. <laughs> out front. Exactly. Keep it tight. So, yeah. I mean, do you guys lose? I mean, when you're, you get the hookup or especially somebody new, is that a, a challenge to get them on that, to keep it out, keep it tight and land, the, you know, land the fish? Not really. I mean, we, we all, all the guides have experience, you know, even back in the day when we first started, uh, you know, the young guides that are taking out a lot of beginners, you know, one of the tips that I had always passed on to the, to the new guys is when you get these new clients, man, and you can't, not everyone learns the same, you know, and, and people definitely, we've all seen it when you're in boats, people, they kind of go to other habits that they've developed other places that have worked. And it's like, I went as far as put uh, electrical tape on the front of my boat back when I first started guiding, where it's like I had a green piece of electrical tape on both sides at about a 45 coming out the front and then a red piece of electrical tape right behind it. Huh. It's like, don't cast in the red, right. cast into the green, into the green. So, you know, nothing more frustrating than being in the back of a boat, uh, you know, and the guy in the front's just, you know, fishing at a terrible angle, yeah, <laughs> getting blocked. So, yeah, no, we preach that pretty hard and, um, yeah, believe it or not, it it works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, in the boats, we just had a, a listener reach out this morning and was saying how he's loved. We did a drift boat series. We had a number of episodes just kind of on the history. In fact, had Clacker Craft, had John on from Clacker Craft and talk a little about that. But maybe take us back there real quick. Was there a time when there weren't a lot of drift boats in your neck of the woods? Talk about that little transition. Yeah, yeah, there there actually was. So I'm old enough to to know like what it used to look like. <laughs> yeah. So there there was a lot of big giant, you know, aluminum tin can drift boats that obviously came from your neck of the woods out this way. Like the uh what you named the brand, but just a big aluminum sixteen foot standard drift boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh River River Master and all those those brands, Willies. Uh, I don't know the guy anymore. I haven't seen him in years, but there was, a uh, an old gentleman that used to come in the sh- the first shops I worked for, uh, his name, Lan- his name was Lance and he claimed, uh, to have brought the first, uh, drift boat east of the Mississippi with a bunch of his, his buddies. He was friends with like Buzz Ramsey, oh, yeah. all those, those old school guys that used to come, they'd come to the Manistee when the Manistee was in its heyday and pull plugs and whatnot, but um, yeah, so that was kind of the early when I first started going up north and drifting rivers and stuff. Everybody had those big aluminums. And then Hyde actually built a facility, not to build the boats, but just a sales a sales building over in Nuego, Michigan. And they kind of, you know, saturated the market for five, 10 years and then bugged out. And then uh, obviously you have Stealthcraft up north, which uh, in Michigan that builds boats. So yeah, more people have them than ever. And, uh, you know, the whole clack of craft deal with us is the boats are light. The boats are narrow. I can't launch a giant 18 foot drift boat with, you know, two, uh, lithium batteries in it. So I can lift my anchor with a push of the button on my, oar. you know, I don't, we don't have time for that or, or, you know, it's just, so the lightest boats you can get in the lowest profile, we're not running big rapids or anything yes we have we have stuff that you got to run that you'll take some water over the bow but you know we don't need a giant mckenzie drift boat to run these rivers you know we need a, something small light maneuverable um you can put a little motor on and and get after it so that's the boat that's that's what you guys do number one for all of us yeah yeah and you have motors on, is that part of the the program you, you kind of go up and down the rivers yeah it just depends on what time of year it is yeah. So, and, and what you're trying to do, you know, in the springtime when I'm guiding like streamer anglers, there might be some 14, 16 mile chunks I'll, I'll take on, uh, during that peak season where I'm just gonna just highlight real, you know, highlight tour the, the best stuff that's going. And I'll use that four horse to just get me down the river quicker and not blow my shoulders out. Right. And are you still, uh, getting after it as far as the guiding or are you, or is it, do you have your kind of guide team out there doing everything? Yeah, no, I still guide. I just, uh, once the kids get out of school in Michigan, we get out of school around the, the 10th of June, 15th of June, somewhere in that window. And then I pretty much shut it down until the kids go back to school, which is next week. So yeah, just, uh, I'm in that, that stage in my life and, uh, I know the importance of it. So got plenty of time to guide. Uh, but yeah, I'll guide, uh, pretty much middle of March, all of April, all of May, and trickle into that first week of June, second week of June, and then uh, turn the dial way back. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome hearing, just you know, even talking to Greg, you know, uh, we were chatting, setting this up, you know, the trip. 
we had great, I can't remember the episode, but, um, you know, you've got, and then Liske, right? You got him coming up doing some stuff. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Let's turn off a small mouth for a little bit and just talk about in general. You guys, I hear about all these events you have going. How does that look and how have you been able to get all these kind of other big, you know, kind of famous, you know, big guy uh, who I think are some of the best guides out there in the country on your team or at least working with you? Yeah, no doubt, man. I, I, longevity, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been doing this since I was a teenager. I'm in my, I'm 43. You know, just not being a jerk. <laughs> right. Right. Don't be a, don't be a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, do what you say you're going to do and uh, treat people well. And, you know, when they come to town and bust their butt for you, compensate them and, you know, put them up in a hotel room, feed them and, uh, you know, just treat people like you would like to be treated if you were going to help support a shop or an outfitter or whatever it may be. So, yeah, I've known Jeff and Greg for a long time. You know, Jeff, so wonderful human and obviously an absolute savage angler that's you know one of those you know he doesn't toot his own horn he doesn't jump up and down he doesn't post a bunch of crap on social media but Jeff Gay is top five for me when it comes to just an absolute savage angler you know Chris Willens another one that you know doesn't go crazy on the socials that's a good friend of mine who's you know I'll put him up there with anybody um, absolute stud from fly to gear. And that's the same for Jeff. People don't realize Jeff is an absolutely amazing all around angler. Right. He's not just a spay fisherman or, you know, he can do anything and he's been doing it since the seventies or earlier. I don't know, but yeah, you got so many guys like those guys that are just, you know, they're not jumping up and down on socials. And they don't have shops, but I mean, just a wealth of knowledge. Um, but yeah, I just try to surround myself with good people that, play well with others and uh you know it keeps the drama down man it really does but yeah guys like blaine right you know i, I met me at shows back when you know i was like going full grassroots just going hitting all the shows and you know networking and doing all that stuff meeting blaine helped our program changed our program and obviously greg greg uh yeah. greg's another one that doesn't get crazy and we're talking about we're talking about senio yeah, Greg sent you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Greg's, uh, you know, at the shop four to five days a week with us working and, uh, you know, an amazing fly tire. Obviously, we're all getting old, but, you know, Greg was a savage when he was out <laughs> yeah. fishing, fishing in his 20s and 30s. And yeah, we all just kind of, you know, you get to a point like where Greg's at, where he's got kids that are, that need him at home and kids that, uh, you know, at sports and all that stuff. So we got time after it, but everyone gets after it and everyone fishes, but yeah, everyone contributes in their own way, whether it be fly tying or, you know, angling knowledge or whatever. And we just like to bring that to our customers. And, you know, some customers realize like they, you know, they come up to you or whatever and say, you know, do you thank you so much? You know, I know how special this is. And then, you know, some people, I think they're just like, hey, whatever. It's just the normal thing at Schultz Outfitters, but it truly is special. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know, it, I mean, it makes sense. And, yeah, we had Greg. He was on back at uh, episode 176 here. Um, we'll have links out to that. But yeah, and you guys have kind of the, um, are the two operations, I mean, the smallmouth bass, the steelhead, is that kind of your bread and butter? Or maybe describe that throughout the year. What are the things that get people coming in? Yeah, so like, you know, if you want me to run through a, a normal year at the shop, it's, yeah, January, a lot of fly tying focused events and classes and, and whatnot. Um, we'll, hit, uh, we'll hit a one show in January where it's mostly conventional tackle, but we'll uproot the whole conventional side and go to a show. Uh, but yeah, a lot of classes, a lot of education in January, uh, February kind of continues that same program. End of February, we'll have a event, uh, called season kickoff or it's our anniversary event shop opened on March 2nd, 2012. And we kind of keep that tradition and that, that, uh, we bring in, uh, you know, usually a headliner and whatnot. Um, I did skip. I did skip one very important thing, Dave. Yeah, the newest one, which is uh, this will be its third year, is uh, Bob in the Hood, which is uh, a fly tying gathering that I right. kind of had this. Yeah, that one's a, a banger, man. Huh. I heard it. Now, is that one that you guys? When do you do that one? That one is always the weekend before Super Bowl. So we do that uh, this year. I think it's the first and second of February. Um. But yeah, it's just a vision I had. Like back, there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure it's changed out where you guys are yeah. at, where shows have kind of slowed Even, down. Yeah, and, yeah. So I always wanted to do something with just fly tying and kind of highlighting, you know, the the techniques and the you know, just what's new. You know, like obviously a lot of stuff you see on the internet 
you know, everything comes pretty quick, but there's kind of this group of guys that are kind of like, you know, not into that anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and a lot of those guys come to the event, you know, and they're, those are the, like a lot of those dudes are the true innovators of a lot of the stuff that um, you're seeing on the internet uh, and the socials right now. But yeah, hearing it from them, hearing how they built it, the fly. I mean, like we have it set up pretty loose where we limit the amount of people. How do you do that? Well, you cap it, but then you, you charge a, a decent amount of money that's kind of going to weed out the, you know, people. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's it's not like this huge money grab. It's got a lot of expenses. We pour a lot of money into it. We pay for all the hotel rooms, the food, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, man, it's cool. We just, just a gathering of uh, like-minded people. You'll have, uh, you know, a 10 or an eight foot table for each tire and then some chairs set up in front of that. So it's real loose where people can sit down and actually talk with these designers of these patterns and whatnot and get a really under the hood look and see how the person that actually designed it, tied it, why he you know designed it, uh, how he ties it and how they, you know, uh, created it. It's just a cool, cool vibe. So that's, that's a big one for us. Who were a couple of people at that? Because I know I heard about it out there. Was this kind of a little bit of all the different species and tying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it for, like the original vision was more of a, a streamer uh, focus. And that's obvious for obvious reasons. There's a lot of room for, I think there's still room for improvement on things there and, and whatnot and a lot of room for innovation uh, and whatnot. So like last year we had, we had Kelly Gallup, we had Blaine Chocolate, we had obviously Greg, we had... Uh, Russ Madden, who's a you know an influencer of a lot of people, oh, yeah. including Kelly. So yeah, um, but yeah, again, it, it all comes back to the the people that play well with others and are good people, and just you know creates a good a good vibe. Some of the guys from up north that are that are studs, Johnny Ray, Ed McCoy, really good guides, and then a bunch of our our reps that are good and kind of made a, a one of the requisites to kind of come is is you make your living off the industry. You know, that's kind of the vision for it was like these people are people that are guides, outfitters, shop owners, you know, it's their full time deal. And uh, that's kind of how we vet it. Yeah, cool, cool. So that's Bob in the hood. And then uh, and then I guess you're getting into smallmouth season eventually right there. Yeah. So we'll roll into the Midwest Fly Fishing Expo in March after that season kickoff event. And uh, as soon as we get done putting the shop back together, I'll start guiding. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's crazy clients, man, that'll go out in January and February if the, if the conditions are right. But yeah, I mean, our official start to the season where we're running multiple guides uh, a day is going to be uh middle to late March, depending on the weather, uh, that type of fishing is, uh, you're fishing to fish that are, you know, in their spot that they've been in since November, you know, they're kind of locked into winter zones. You're fishing flies in the jig, weighted flies. Uh, flies that have a lot of motion without movement really were rabbit marabou and rubber legs and all that stuff and then once you get that water hits uh hits 45 uh things change and fish will really jump on swim flies and flies that uh, you can almost get to the point where you're taking them away from them instead of feeding them so that really that once that is just you know we want that zone to hang out for as long as possible right. You know, because that 45 to 55 is kind of the magic window. Is that, that's the water temp? Yeah. Yeah. It's your water temp. It's your, your, you know, kind of the last 10 degrees before the, the spawn. And, uh, you know, if we can get a month of that, that's like, you know, what the guides would be super stoked about. And that's where you're going to not only get your, you can, you have the opportunity to catch 20, 21 inch fish, but those fish are going to be the heaviest they're going to be all year. Oh, right. Cause they're getting ready. Yeah, we're getting ready. So yeah, so that kind of kicks it all off, man. Is is that that streamer fishing? That's it. So that's it. And so those are kind. Of, is that kind of three times throughout the year? You have the the winter time with smallmouth, where you're kind of having to feed them. You got that in between before the spawn, where they're aggressive and chasing. And then after the spawn, you you get into the the summer, where they're they get aggressive again on the surface. Is that is that kind of how it looks? Yeah, it just depends on uh, you know water levels. But I mean, your top water fishing could be really you know, wild where you're just zinging that thing out and popping it and being aggressive and getting, you know, crazy strikes to go in straight up trout style where you're feeding them terrestrials. And that's all this depends on water levels. And, you know, when did you get that last shot of water? You know, when did you get that last reset? Are you 14 days stale on a fall or you got something that kind of resets the system that makes them go? So 
it's whatever whatever old mother nature gives you man yeah adjust and make it happen what is the perfect uh, water flow? Is it, is it kind of uh, high water and then dropping? What is the perfect uh, that you like in the summer? In the summer, I just, I like a shot of water because at some point it's going to be like Christmas morning. You know, you're going to hit that day where it's just going off. But yeah, I was just up on vacation with the family here, kind of our last hurrah. And uh, the river that we were on went from 1,000 to 1,600 CFS. And it was just awesome, awesome fishing for the last few days we were there. And then, you know, earlier in the week, it was really finesse techniques and stuff that were, that were taking the fish and they wouldn't, they wouldn't take like a crazy top water presentation, but, uh, yeah, it's just all about that, whatever resets the system, you know, and, uh, water temps in the summertime, you know, they're going to be 70 to 80 degrees. So your water temp drops and rises are going to be more important, you know, in the spring and in the fall where in the summer you're pretty stable. You're just kind of other things become more of a factor, right? Yep. I see. Okay. And and you mentioned maybe the finesse. Talk about that a little bit. If you've got, you know, we're out there again, taking it to July. Talk about how you're finessing it versus maybe doing something, a different type of retrieve or action. Yeah. Finesse fishing, you know, it, it could be, like I said, anything from a small, you know, foam damsel dragonfly type deal to just finesse fishing a larger popper just being patient with it. Right. So letting it, you know, the guides are going to know where the fish are at. You just need to put the fly there and listen to what they say. Um, and eventually the opportunity will present. So yeah, you can fish boogle bugs, uh, which are just poppers. You know, they come in various sizes. We tend to, to lean towards size fours and size sixes are kind of our bread and butter. It's the biggest one. And then the one size down from the largest. And uh, yeah, you just, you know, lighten up your tippet slightly. You might go down to like 10 pound on the, on the tippet and go smaller on the boogle bug, but it's just, it all comes back to that, keeping it out front, keeping that thing out front and uh, letting it ride. And uh, yeah, we have other things too that you could do where there's uh, fish that are feeding off of turtles. So that this time of year that you could roll around and, and sight fish almost like you're saltwater fishing, like you're bone fishing or permit fishing, you're just cruising around, you got that fly in your hand and you're looking, you're looking, you're looking. And eventually you'll stump the guides. know you'll come into these areas that just are frequented by these soft shell uh, turtles. And they are on the bottom grubbing around feeding and dislodging bugs and, you know, bait fish and all kinds of stuff that small moth like to take advantage of. And uh, there'll be usually two, three up to 10, fish following that turtle around oh, and uh yeah and they're pretty locked in pretty honed in on the back because they've got all their buddies there they're trying to get the same food that they are so the whole trick to the turtle thing is you you can't spook the turtle helena exists as a crossroads between past and present tame and untamed mountainous wilderness and hometown warmth a place where you can float the river without seeing a soul Stroll through their charming downtown, enjoy breweries and breathtaking views all in the same day. It isn't a secret for passionate anglers that Helena is most sought after for its close vicinity to world-class blue ribbon fishing on the Missouri. Then what is the secret about fly fishing in Helena? The continual slow ripple of the river, animals roaming the banks, the solitude of the river surrounded by mountains, and of course, the sound of a rod bending to an epic trout. For those looking for serenity and a low-key fishing destination, Helena's Missouri River begs to challenge new and advanced fly fishing anglers in Montana. They are unexpected, unfussy, unspoiled. They don't pretend to be anything they're not, and they are proud of who they are. But don't take it from us. Come discover Helena's fly fishing secrets for yourself. Visit Helena, Montana right now. That's HelenaMT.com. So describe a little bit on this, uh, this turtle fishing. Is this something new you guys have been doing here uh, recently? Well, I mean, I, I first, you know, saw I go down, you know, probably 10, 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, but definitely refined it over the last five years, um, to where it's more, uh, you know, we're better at it (laughs) just like you do it enough. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, like I was saying, it's, uh, it's a program that 99% of the time is done with a single angler it's more of a saltwater type experience where you're standing up on the bow with, you know, the fly in your hand, and a long leader, and you're, you're scanning, constantly scanning the guide standing. He's, he's scanning as well. I actually have a um, cool boat that Justin over at Adipose built for us. That's uh it's a South Fork skiff 
kind of adipose hybrid. I think he called it the thing. And it has a deck, decks on the front and back. So you, the client's elevated standing up on a, a deck and you just, it's, you know, sniping, sniping tower. So that's, that's really cool to do that. And, uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's one of those things that doesn't happen everywhere. It's a program that it's like a, almost, I believe it's not a necessity for the fish in that specific environment. Um, where it, it's not, it happens on rivers that don't have a crazy high bait fish population to where the fish, you know, that's what they need to feed on. You know, it's not that, it's not that the rivers that it happens on have more dragonflies or damselflies. It's just, they have less forage, I believe, and the fish key in on it. So yeah, it's pretty, uh, awesome, awesome way to do it. Uh, you know, anybody that, uh, says like smallmouth are easy and, you know, they're, they can be super duper selective and some of the stuff that we've seen out there, you know, with fish coming up and bumping flies and, and whatnot. Like if you've never seen it before, you wouldn't believe it, you know, type stuff. It's pretty neat, pretty special. So they're down there. They're just kind of hanging out, feeding off the the turtles as they're, you know, kind of getting things kicked up. And then what do you do? Just toss your fly in just like you would be like on the salt, get it close and then give it some action. Yeah, so uh, there are definitely are times where a streamer will shine in that situation, and that's kind of where I where we started back in the day was we started throwing really small bait fish patterns at them, and it it works. There's an old video out there. I have no idea how long ago it was filmed, but there's an old video out there, probably from 2014, 15, somewhere around there, of me me doing it, and I was doing it with small uh, feather game changers back in the day, like right when right when I met Blaine. But it's kind of evolved and we do better now on terrestrials, more of a, well, actually like a, a dragonfly or a damselfly type pattern. Uh, and yeah, the biggest thing is just, you know, you can't, can't spook the turtle, like the turtle's everything. So if you, if you tap your foot, if you make one wrong move, if anybody is familiar with those soft shell turtles, they're really curious. They'll pop their head up out of the water and uh, they'll look at you for a second and then they'll swim away as fast as they can swim. <laughs> and and yeah. uh it's over after that. But um yeah, if you if you you don't want to like land it right on the back of the the turtle, you don't want to land it right on the fish. You kind of want to land it kind of short and off to the side and usually you'll get one of the fish to one or more to peel off and uh and take a look at it. And uh if you tie the right fly and you you do things right, then they'll eat it. If you if you grab one out of the store bin and chuck that out there, <laughs> there's a good chance it's not going to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. And what, what is the fly? What's the, do you have a pattern name of the, the damn, of that fly that would be good? We have a few, but it's just like, you're always just rotating them, right? You're always tying something just slightly different. You know, I use like, I use a lot of peacock or peacock ice stubbing for the underside. And it's not just a perfect sheet of foam. I'll kind of take a uh, cauterizer to it and kind of burn it up. Uh, texture it almost and uh, make it ride a little bit lower uh, versus perfectly on the top, you know, and then like changing color uh, can be important. So your blacks, your tans, your olives, your browns, like natural stuff. And then I definitely got some tricks on the legs and the things, certain rubber legs that tend to work. And then I'll take some of that Sanyos Predator wrap um, that guys use for steelhead flies and mix that up uh, for, for the wing maybe mix that up with some like Montana fly company, uh, barred sexy floss kind of, I got my favorite colors and whatnot that work and you just got to be observant of what's going on. What are they eating? You know, these dragonflies around here, they'll, they migrate, they move through and you got some here certain times of year and some others and there's certain shapes to them, you know, profiles to everything, you know, when it comes to that. And, uh, there definitely are times that we need to run light, lighter lines you know where you're running like a really light uh a 3x tippet you know or something where most of the time when you get hooks in these fish with a streamer or a frog or something like i'm not saying the game's over but there's a really good chance that fish is coming to the net you know the whole terrestrial thing it's hard to get them to eat and then once you got them on now you're fighting a fish that's usually in lower flows with light tippet on a six weight you know, it's, it can be a little, little nerve wracking and they'll take you into the wood piles and it don't mess around. <laughs> what, what's your trick to keep them from going into the wood piles? Uh, as soon as the client hooks up, I am uh, forward rowing to get on top of the fish immediately. 
it's definitely not a, you know, let the fish just walk you around, <laughs> you know, scenario. So you kind of got to get on them, especially if it's a big fish. If I know it's a, a 20 inch fish or a 19 inch fish, you know, big one and 21 inch fish, big fish, you're going to like enjoy the fight of a 17. Let's get this thing in the net. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so no messing around when you're doing that. You kind of both the guide and the angler need to be on their A game. and Definitely something that is discussed um, throughout the day of what is the game plan when it does happen and kind of positive reinforcement of what we need to do when it goes down. Gotcha. Sounds like the boat is a super you know, awesome way to kind of get some of these big fish. Could you also do this? Are people doing this by foot finding spots or is it challenging to find big fish by, by foot? It's, I definitely respect anybody that can go out and catch, you know, big small mouth on foot with a fly rod. There's definitely are certain techniques that are good for that, like hex fishing, you know, it's not a bad way to do it on foot. It's fun or fishing frogs at night, that kind of stuff. But the boat aids in so many ways, you know, so it's almost like, you know, let's just say we're, you know, yet fly fishing is bow hunting the whole fly fishing on foot for small mouth on these rivers that we guide. That's uh you're on with a recurve, man. Mm, you know, that's it's, it. it's yeah. I think it's next level, mad respect to the guys out there that get it done on foot. Yep. Yeah. That's it. And, and are you guys, uh, is the cicada thing going on at all? Is that, has that been out in your neck of the woods? We don't have that around. We have, we have our annuals, which, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that fishing a black boogle bug or an olive mossy colored boogie bug, whatever they call that one. Um, you know, that is being taken at times for a cicada. I live on a piece of property that has a lot of uh, pine trees and the, the bark on the pine trees. So the past months, it's just been, cica- you know, annual cicadas. Um, but we didn't have the periodics. We don't have that up in this area. I did actually go down to Indiana to do that this year, which was a cool experience. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. For smallmouth? No, carp. Oh, carp. Yeah. Asian carp. Um, you know, the, um, just commons. Yeah, just common. And, and, uh, yeah, commons and uh, what's the other one? Grass carp. Oh, and grass carp. Yeah, grass carp. Yeah, that was kind of cool doing that. But yeah, we don't have that. But I, if you know, there's no doubt they take advantage of them. Yeah, you know, on a yearly basis. Do they kind of take advantage of you know opportunistic whatever? You know, I kind of go back again back to the trout. You think of you always hear you know as they get bigger, maybe some of these big rainbows are eating other fish, right? Is it the same with bass when they're smaller? Are they eating more different things? Or are they always eating? You know, are they always predators? Yeah, they're always predators. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, they're really uh, there's definitely fish. It's it, it product their environment, right? So the shop where the shop is at, uh, there is a, just a crazy amount of caddis. Oh wow! There's tons of caddis, and you'll catch a 12 inch, 14 inch fish. Uh, and you look at its mouth and it's just caddis. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, where I've never seen that on other, ri- other sections of river of that river, you know, it's just like one of those things, but yeah, every, they're, you know, they're product of their environment. They're going to eat crayfish, you know, definitely a number one food source. You catch up fish this time of year. that's busting at the gut. There's a chance that you're going to have some crayfish in your boat. You know, they, they obviously eat hexes, the frogs, some rivers are really good for frog fishing. Some are not so good right you can still go out and catch yeah. a fish on a frog on any of the rivers but some rivers are just dynamite for frogs and they're used to eat them same deal for your bait fish you talked about it earlier about or we talked about it how some of the rivers connect directly to the great lakes so any of those rivers that don't have you know the below the lowest dam are going to have all kinds of different bait fish that, that migrate at different times of years whether it's the spring or the fall and that's just kind of how you you know as the season progresses and moves through water levels are important water temperatures are important but as you get into the fall there's certain watersheds that become way more important due to an influx of bait fish so your your september your october your november your december fishing you know is a lot of that revolves around around bait fish and then that on the early end of that end of that uh, window there uh, a lot of minnow, a lot of minnow stuff and a lot of frog stuff on the surface. So, yeah, yeah, it's all, man, it's all about knowing, right? It's diverse. It's diver- very diverse. Yeah. And it's, it's That's like, a cool thing. Yeah. You gotta, you don't, you'll never figure these things out unless you put a lot of hours in. Right. And that's, what's cool about doing this trip that we're talking about is that we're going to, and doing any, really any trip with the guide, you know, I mean, you can learn it on your own, right? It's just, it's just going to take you a lot longer to get to that level. And, uh, so we're, this is exciting. Uh, what about casting? So, We've had a number of episodes on casting recently. We had Bruce Richards on, talked about it, and kind of the 
you know, whatever the essentials are on it. But is that a challenge out here, casting some of these bigger bugs? What do you tell somebody if, if they're kind of not familiar with the casting heavy stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, casting is everything. If you can't skate, you can't play hockey, if you can't cast, you can't fly fish, right? Right. So, yeah, casting is everything. I would say that, um, you know, the thing, obviously the things that we preach is like the angle is the most important thing when you're first starting out. So the casting angle is important, but getting the fly out there obviously is important as well. Most of the fly lines that we're going to be fishing are going to be in that mid thirties to mid 40 head length. So, you know, most of the lines are going to be slightly over, you know, your standard, you know, measure of uh, fly line grain weights. So you're going to be bumped up uh, slightly. Uh, leaders are going to be important. You know, there's definitely not the style of fishing that we do. You're not going to go grab a leader off the wall and you can go do it. It's going to be build your own type stuff. So, uh, leader build is important, but the whole casting thing, it's like, if you can cast on your backhand, that's going to be very, very, very important, not only to fish out of a boat, uh, but just to kind of fish our program, you know, where that fly lands, uh, where that fly line lands you know, whether you're on your backhand or on your forehand, it's different, right? Unless you're like yeah. some, you know, super wizard that's doing like aerial men's and stuff, which <laughs> most of the people that are paying to go fishing aren't doing that stuff. <laughs> no. So you're saying on your backhand, just like the actually casting with the back and letting and hitting the fish with your back cast. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you're on the front of the boat, you're a right-handed caster, you're moving downstream and you're casting across your body on your backhand while your buddy in the back is right-hander casting off his right shoulder. You know, yeah, so to the opposite side, right? Yeah, so you want to be able to work a, a, a bank or whatever. So yeah, being able to cast in your backhand, I would say that, um, you know, like uh, it's not if we are throwing bigger flies, you're not going to want to have like hard stops on your forward and your back, right? right. It's going to be more of a, a Belgian style cast, a elliptical cast, a gravity cast, whatever you want to call it, where you're keeping that fly in motion. Same skills you'd use to go bone fishing or permit fishing. Um, you know, not your basic Orvis fly fish 101 fly cast, you know, there's a difference between fly casters and fly anglers, you know, and being able to cast proficiently on your forehand, backhand and different scenarios, different rod angles is all important. You know, it's all about practice, right? So if you don't have a crazy amount of time to be fishing all the time, you're going to need to go to the driving range. You're going to need to practice casting, you know, and it's not just going to be overhead casting. It's going to be backhand. It's going to be various angles. It's going to be maybe setting up your, you know, put your Yeti cooler out in your backyard and stand on it and, uh, you know, do some visualization exercises. Right. Um, you know, what are you going to do when that fish eats? You know, it's, there's a hesitation there, uh, when you're on the, on the topwater game that, you know, you can't get too excited and rip that fly out of the fish's mouth. Um, so Casting on that angle, getting that fly out there, having the right amount of tension, you know, no slack in the line, playing that fine line between just enough uh, to have a natural presentation, not have too much slack. And then when that fish eats, give them that, uh, give them that Saturday morning, uh, TNT, Bill Dance, Booyah hook set, you know? Right. What is that hook set? Is that it? Just rip it as hard as you can. Maybe describe that. Yeah. I mean, you, there's definitely on the top water stuff, there's a delay, but more times than not, you know, it's nothing fancy. It's not like you're strip setting them and you have to be conscious of the shape of their mouth or anything. It's, you know, you just, you let them eat it and give yourself a second, set the hook and prepare for the ride. That's it. So basically let them eat it. You watch them eat it, do a one second count and then set the hooks like straight up or to the side or. Uh, It's situational, but you know, depending on what's going on, but yeah, most of the time it's just straight up. Yeah, it's just straight up, man. You know, like what guides would say, don't trout set. Like, I mean, I a bass set is, I think, a little bit different than a trout set. But, you know, a trout set's going to be the strip set on a topwater fly. Yeah, so the trout set is different. This is different than a trout set. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, define a trout set, you know, like I, yeah, I, I don't see, know. Yeah, what is the, you know, is it like a little dainty dry fly eat? Well, just, I guess it's always, the thing is always the, uh, yeah, you always hear the strip set versus the trout set, right? Don't yeah. trout set when you're out in salt, but. But yeah, what is the trout set? Is it straight up or is it to the side or right? All yeah, that stuff yeah. is different. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say, you know, just hit them. Just hit them. We can, we can make some mistakes on the smaller ones. Just don't miss the big one. <laughs> yeah. The big one. That's yeah. Right. But, but most people, if they do miss them, Dave, it's going to be like just too quick, you know, too quick. You know, it's way too yeah. quick. It's like, hey, man, have a beer. Have a beer. Let's slow you down a little bit. 
Yeah. <laughs> so there is time. So on this trip that we're going to be doing, there's going to be time to drink a beer while on the boat, or is it something you have to always be ready? No, you're more than welcome to, to drink a beer. <laughs> or, or drink a beverage. It doesn't have to be a beer. We're, just, I, we're, we're joking about it because we got this musky trip, and Dan you know, keeps saying, like, man, you know, you might get one shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know yeah, I mean? yeah. you got to be on it. It's not quite like that. No, no, because like by the time you get to the summer, there's going to be some areas where you'll be able to just say, hey, guys, we're going to push, push for 100 yards or whatever to get us through. Uh, but yeah, musky fishing, man, like I, I did it for years. I'm fortunate to rub, rub elbows with, with uh, you know, be good friends with Chris Willen and be good friends with Blaine. And, you know, like I went up there and I to the, their waters and just, you know, went at it like a maniac and just cut it up and just fish my butt off for five straight days. And then there's other times where you go up there and just be a little more methodical with it. And I'd say it's, it's 50, 50. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Is that something, I mean, how is that for you? Is it, uh, do you like that, the pain, you know, of, of the, the skunk days? Like, how does that compare to what this bass that we're going to be doing? You know, the mental aspect of things have, has never been an issue for me, but like, that's just, that just tore my elbow up, you know? So right. I, I kind of, I did it. I had some good times, caught some great fish and memories. I, I wouldn't say it's completely in my in my rear view mirror, but, uh, my desire to go out and just beat the crap out of my body to get a muskie in the net. I just, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's only so many bullets in the gun and do I want to spend them on that? So, um, mad respect for those guys that do that. And, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a young man's game. Yeah. Right, right, right. No, it's cool. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we all evolve. That's what's amazing about fly fishing and, and just really anything, right? You evolve and you kind of, you're into one thing and then now you're into something else. But uh, but yeah, I think it's always more than just the fishing, which is cool. But let's take it out of here. This is our, I've got a winner uh, shout out segment that we've been doing with our giveaways. And we're going to talk about this trip a little bit more here and then we'll take it out. But this one today is presented by Squall of Fly Fishing. They've got some great products out there. We're giving a shout out to some of the good stuff they have going but talk about this trip. So we've got, and I want to give one shout out to Greg Mills, who won the Alaska trip uh, that we're heading up to. But we're giving away one spot for somebody to come up here. What are you telling that person who's brand new, never fished for bass before on the phone, and you're kind of doing the expectations? What are you telling that person? Just be willing to listen to your guide, uh, fish the program that we're currently running, be patient. Uh, work on your casting before you come. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna help you. We're not just like we're not the kind of guys that just give up on people when we see they can't cast. Like all the guys that work for, for the shop and for me are just, uh, absolute rock stars. So very, very patient on that front, but definitely work on it. Um, if you're bringing your own gear, please take our recommendations on lines and setups, because if you bring something goofy, there's a good chance that the guy's going to be like, Hey man, why don't you just use my stuff? Very specific. You know, you're not going to get into our guides boats and find, 10 year old rods and cork falling off and cracked fly lines. Everyone's fishing clean, high end stuff. So if you don't feel like bringing your own stuff, don't, um, I know you already have your hands on the pre-trip information, but you know, I often joke people on that is like, you know, they start asking a bunch of questions. Like, did you read the pre-trip? Well, I didn't read the pre-trip. Well, read the pre-trip and then we can answer some questions, but you know, we're pretty open. Uh, we're all on the same page when it comes to the guides and the shop staff. So they're going to be able to point you in the right directions. If you do want to, you know, hop up your gear to have the right, uh, right gear to go out and attack these fish. But yeah, it's just, uh, it's just a cool place. Uh, very, um, you know, for about um, the amount of time that we spend talking about it, it's really, I'd be very surprised if you, you saw, you know, other anglers out fly fishing in the same style that we are fishing. Um, you know, summer's obviously peak. That's when you're going to have your best chance of running into other people, but the rivers are fairly, um, you know, kind of got them, got them to ourselves for the most part when it comes to the fly fishing and the things and the drift boats and stuff. So you're going to have solitude. I think that's one thing that really rocks people when they come here. They're like, I wait a minute. I fly into Detroit and then I drive an hour and then I'm in the middle of nowhere. And I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you, like, it feels like it. You know, it yeah. feels like it, you know, a lot of the rivers are, um, they get big in the spring. So if there is any development on the rivers in the way of homes and whatnot, they're set up on ridges and they're up pretty high. And by the time you, you get here, there's, you know, where it'll be full foliage and summer will be popping and the trees will be, have you know, leaves on them. And yeah. It's a quiet place, man. Like it rocks people. Like 
I see more people going, when I go up north to go smallmouth fishing and just take my kids out on random rivers, I see more of my customers and friends and people that I know fishing other waters than I do, oh, right. I do on ours, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but there's a lot of, it's hard, right? It's like, there's not like, you don't just grab a map and it's like, you know, here's the boat ramp and here's the other boat ramp. It's not like that. It's undeveloped for the most part. Yeah. And you kind of got to be creative uh, for your exits and, and entry points. God, that is really cool. Yeah. That is really cool. And so that's awesome to hear your clients, you know, they're fishing other waters. Is that, you know, if somebody's coming on this trip, let's just say they're coming out from somewhere out West to fish this, could they take some of this back? Do you think to fishing smallmouth in other areas or maybe even other species? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we, we do for smallmouth, we'll take those techniques and, uh, you know, apply them to trout fishing, you know, the, the few times a year that we do it and it works. I think you're just showing, showing fish other stuff that they haven't seen before, different angles of approach and different flies and, and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, there's definitely, you know, casting the stuff that the guides will be able to teach on the casting front and, uh, ask questions, you know, you know, all the guys are personable and they talk and it's, you know, they're not, we've all been in guide boats where it's like, is this guy going to say anything? Um, you know, it's like I said, it's not, it's not an amusement park. Uh, you know, it's not a resort guide. It's, it's, uh, an independent contractor, business owner, you know, the guys that work for me, they all own their own businesses. They just happen. Oh, they do. Yeah. Yeah. They just happen to, you know, work exclusively through Schultz Outfitters, but they're building their book of business. You know, it's, it's a different crew, man. It's how you hire. Right. Right, right, right. And that's how I think we're going to do it on this trip is we're going to have three days fully guided on the water and then we'll be there four nights. And on those three days, I think, you know, we're going to have six spots that are available. You know, they're available right now Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're going to mix it up, right? I think maybe we'll go out with one guide one day and then maybe mix it up to a different river. Is that how this might look? We can kind of mix it up a little bit. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like I said, the guides have their own program. I'm not going to say, Hey guys, here's your list of stuff we're doing this week. That's not how we work. So I don't tell the guides where to go. They do their own thing. They have their own start times. They have their own finish times. And, uh, yeah, we'll just, uh, kind of be pretty loosey goosey on it and, uh, uh, just play to the uh, current conditions. Um, that's the biggest thing you just really can't We often, you know, have to tell people like the people will call the shop and be like, I want to go on this day on this river. It's like, well, we book guide trips, we book dates. We don't book rivers. That makes sense. And that's probably part of the thing that, you know, you, you're talking, right? I'm sure you guys are all talking, you know, where things are hot. Is, is that something that gives you a little bit of an advantage, you know, between all the guys and the guys? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, there's four to six people on the water and we're all sharing information and whatever. You got a group trip in town and, you know, let's just be honest here. You, one of my guides goes out with, you know, John B the first day and he sees what his skills are and, you know, other guy goes out and crushes him on a float and he's got John B the next day. It's like, Hey, let's put John B in this position to go have success. You know, it's, it's, you got to do that. You know, it's like, none of the guys are selfish. They're all willing to, you know, make everybody happy and everyone, everyone's program works. So yeah, we'll just kind of see what we got, um, going into it skill wise after day one. And then we'll kind of park guys out and say, you go here, you go here with them and move people around. But that time of year, there's there's usually several options to do. I mean, there's 30, 40 floats. Oh, cool. Yeah. We'll be chatting about that. That'll be the cool thing is we'll be hanging out, chatting about it, and then coming back at the end of the day and talking about, you know, sharing some stories, right? That's yeah. what's going to be cool. Nice. Well, let me just give a, a shout out to our, you know, if people want to grab one of these spots, wetflyswing.com slash smallmouth bass. Um, that's where people can go right now. But we also have this giveaway event that people can enter at uh, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. And of course, SchultzOutfitters.com, if they just want to connect with you, would be good. Um, before we take it out of here, Mike, I want to touch on that baseball because I love baseball was one of my sports. You know, as a kid, I always go back to baseball and basketball. But your kids, are they, I know baseball's huge around the country, but uh, is this like they're out there competing? Is this pretty high level stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's different levels of travel ball. But um, yeah, we, we travel around. We got to Omaha this year for the World Series. and they, Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah, my oldest played out there for not in the World Series, but you know, there's like a little uh, yeah. amateur tournament that goes along with it. Um, so yeah, I got to do that and experience that. But yeah, they, they travel all over the place and um, definitely eats up the vast majority of our uh, our spring on the weekends. But uh, a lot of fun, you know, teach them a lot and 
you know, from a parent's view, like baseball is a lot different than hockey <laughs> when it comes oh, it to everything. Yeah, it's just a totally different different vibe. Why is that? Because I, I know the baseball, I don't know the hockey, but what, why is hockey so much? Or why are they different? What, what is the big difference? I think the individual aspect of, of baseball or the hitting comes into play. You know, there's like no, there's no place to hide on the field, you know, in baseball, like you make an error. So there's like a lot of emotional, uh, you know, ups and downs and streakiness to the game and different players and stuff. So that's, that's one thing I, I've noticed, <laughs> you yeah. know, or hockey, you're, you're, it's a hundred percent a team thing. And, um, you know, it's just a different, different vibe, man, different parents. <laughs> you know, it's right. T- right. Different. Yeah. 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 Wh- which one is the, which one is the crazier, which one has the crazier parents on it? We are very fortunate to have uh, landed on teams that kind of reach this, like, you know, it's like there's a lot of, uh, there's parent cuts. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I'm lucky, but I mean, witnessing stuff that, you know, it's just, I don't know. I think the baseball thing is more like it's just kind of all about one kid. You know, it's all about my kid or, or hockey's more about the, about the team. Yeah, I gotcha. What were your sports growing up? Yeah, I played baseball until I was a freshman in high school and then I, I played hockey all the way through. Oh, you did. Uh, so those were yeah. your sports too. Yeah. So I was more of a hockey guy, but yeah, it's um, yeah, just a different world, man. Different world. Things have things have changed. Are you still doing it? Do you still play baseball or hockey yourself? I don't have time, man. I do not. I do not. I don't even have time to coach the kids anymore. I coached them when they were young, and as they've grown up, they've uh, made better teams, and uh, you know, don't need that anymore. So yeah, I hear um, you. let's me fish more. <laughs> Cool. Cool, Mike. Well, this has been good. I appreciate your uh, your time today. We had a little bit of technical difficulty, so this has been great to put this together. And uh, well, like I said, SchultzOutfitters.com. And this trip, I'm excited to meet you in person and get our listeners and everybody out, you know, to your neck of the woods and, you know, Michigan experience that whole thing. So yeah, I appreciate all your time today and definitely looking forward to uh, getting on this trip. Yeah, sounds good, brother. And if there's anybody out there that's potentially thinking about doing it and they want to set up a time to chat, I'm an open book, man, and more than, uh, more than willing to do that. So Feel free to pass my phone number on to them and uh, we'll set up a time to chat. All right. If you want to get in on this trip, uh, we got a couple opportunities right now. First of all, if you want to check in on the giveaway, enter at wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. But if you want to save one of the few spots we have for this trip right now, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash smallmouth bass and enter your name and email. We'll follow up with you on availability right there. Please follow the show if you get a chance. That's the best way to support us and make sure things are always moving ahead and we've got great guests on the show. I want to give you a heads up on the shop. We are live, the shop, Wet Fly Swing Pro. And if you want a shot at this Schultz trip, your best chance is to join the shop. And if you do that, we're going to give you a little discount and get you in on this trip. So the shop, Wet Fly Swing Pro, you can get in on it right now, 50% off uh, for life. If you check it out now, that's wetflyswing.com slash pro. And I'll fill you in on the details there. All right. A uh, quick shout out to our conservation partner next week, or uh, next uh, next Wednesday, this Wednesday, uh, Huron River Watershed Council will be on. We're going to be talking everything about the Huron River. It's one of the great groups out in this part of the country. And so a little call to action for you. Why don't you send me an email if you're listening right now to the very end and let me know who your local watershed council is. Who's that group that's protecting the species out there? Send me an email and just put conservation in the uh, subject line and that will be a great start all right i'm gonna let you get out of here hope you have a great late morning i hope you have a great uh afternoon or great evening wherever in the world you are looking forward to seeing you on that next episode talk to you then thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show for notes and links from this episode visit wetflyswing.com